I'm really excited to be here, and thanks so much for inviting me and put together this interdisciplinary program. I found every presentation just incredibly fascinating. Um, let me start with a standard federal government disclaimer that these are not the views of the Federal Reserve Board. Um, this presentation also builds on work with two colleagues who also currently have government positions. So um, Adair Morris is currently at the Treasury, Carol Evans is currently at the CFPB, doesn't represent their views either. Um, and also, as I hope is obvious, I am not the second lady, Karen Pence, so this is not um, the views of any members of the executive branch. Um, just to give an overview about what I'm going to talk today. So the big picture question is, how does fintech change disparities and discrimination in financial services? Um, so financial innovations can expand access to credit and weigh against some aspects of discrimination. And these innovations have been pretty heavily hyped. Um, however, you know, the forces that lead to discrimination in the analog world also lead to discrimination in the digital world. So um, a lot of what I'm saying is people have pressed me on this talk, what is different about discrimination in the digital world from the analog world? I've had to say, actually, not very much. Um, you know, it's profitable to discriminate, and so people are going to try to find a way to do it. Some people are. Um, the difference, I think, is that algorithms add a sophistication and complexity and opacity that can amplify these traditional forms of discrimination. And in particular, it can reintroduce proxies for race and other protected characteristics in ways that are opaque and difficult to monitor. And it can lead to consumers seeing different products or prices. So we now have the ability to tailor product offers and prices literally to the level of the individual. So when you say log on to Facebook, you're seeing something different from someone else logging on. Um, and a question in this presentation, which I'm not going to answer, but I'd like all of us to think about, is whether the current state of legislation and governance is sufficient for this added complexity. Um, so first, just to quickly orient us about just how enormous um, the disparities in access are to financial services, especially across race and ethnic groups. Um, this is data from the FDIC, the share of uh, households that are unbanked. You can see for white and Asian households, less than 3% have you know, no checking or savings account. Those numbers are 12, 14, 16% for other race groups. If you look at um, being turned down from credit, that also differs dramatically across race and ethnic groups. So um, in 2020, um, less than 10% of Asian adults reported having been turned down from credit, about 20% of white households, 40% um, and close to 40% for Black and Hispanic or Latino households. And the thing that to me is particularly amazing, the kind of the dark purple bar, shows that these disparities exist even conditioning on measures of relative socioeconomic disadvantage. So these are for adults earning more than $100,000 a year you can see even within that group, nearly a quarter of blacks have had the experience of being turned down for credit. Um, so this is something which is a fairly common feature of life um, for minority households in a way that is not necessarily for other households. Um, and a lot of people have said, well, you know, FinTech can alleviate these disparities. FinTech can increase access to credit. Um, and basically, broadly, what I'm fintech has a lot of different meanings. So I'm not talking here about speculating in Bitcoin, to be clear. Um, I'm talking about new sources of data combined with new analytic methods. And it's true, this combination has the potential to give more accurate underwriting models, lower costs of underwriting, potential to expand access to credit. And so fintech has been touted as something that can help alleviate these enormous disparities that I showed you. Um, and there's research that that's true. Um, so there's a group, FinReg Lab, they did an evaluation of what's known as cash flow data. So the idea that, you know, one of the big data sources that's being exploited now is looking at literally your checking account, how much cash is coming in and out, how stable is that? Um, that's a new source of data that wasn't traditionally used in underwriting, that's been shown to have promise for expanding access to credit. Um, in the mortgage market, um, Adair's paper joint with Bobby Bartlett, Richard Stanton, Nancy Wallace, um, they looked at discrimination in the mortgage market, or at least differences in the rates charged to white households relative to black and Latinx households. And they said, wow, these differences are a lot lower for algorithmic lenders. And we don't see any differences in rejection rates across race for the algorithmic lenders, whereas we do for the traditional lenders. 
Um, so that's kind of promising. Um, there's another academic study that analyzed data from a high cost lender in the United Kingdom. And they said, you know, this lender would have had less bias in his underwriting decisions if it relied more on algorithms and less on human discretion. And that's sort of a common theme in this literature, the idea that human discretion is a real problem. So um, discretion um, can really um, promote discrimination by taking away discretion from people and turning it over to machines, you might get better outcomes. Um, so that's the promising part. I'm gonna spend more time here on the um, darker part, which is saying, yes, there's this promise, but can fintech introduce new disparities and new avenues of discrimination? And I'm gonna talk broadly about three avenues of discrimination. Um, the first avenue is people. So um, it's kind of a funny thing to say, but even in the fintech world, people still play a pretty prominent part and thus so does human discretion. Um, there's a bunch of, of studies done a few years ago talking about peer to peer platform, so Airbnb, and saying, you know, people still have discretion in those platforms. Um, just because you're now using a platform doesn't cause um, discrimination to go away. So there were studies showing that um, Airbnb applicants with distinctively African-American names were less likely to be approved by a host um, to um, rent the Airbnb. Um, other things about appearance, attractive borrowers are more lo likely to be selected for loans by peer lenders on prosper.com. And this turns out to be a pretty hard dynamic to eradicate. Um, you know, platforms have an incentive to show names and pictures because it appears to build trust. Um, and this is in this Dole Atkenstein paper that was referenced um, right before lunch. And there's a Communications Decency Act and some of his, plat some of his provisions um, shield the platforms from being held liable for this. So this one's kind of a hard one to crack. Um, the other one in theory where people come in is easier to crack. I say in theory because all of us who have been kind of in the trenches of diversity and inclusion know these are pretty um, difficult issues, but algorithm development teams are just not diverse. So black and Latinx individuals are underrepresented in Silicon Valley. And if you don't have a diverse team, you're more likely to make mistakes, specifying the problem wrong, using the wrong data set. Um, the right-hand side, side just shows you those disparities. So this is based on a Brookings paper, but it shows you, for example, that although blacks represent 12% of um, a typical occupation on average, they're only 7% of consumer programmers. Um, likewise, Hispanic workers are 17% of workers overall and just 6% of computer programmers. So if you don't have a diverse team putting your algorithms together, you're more likely to get um, unequal outcomes. Um, second avenue is through data. Um, so it turns out that you know, our data sets reflect our biases. And so there's a couple of examples that have really got a lot of publicity. Um, language reflects our biases. So um, this is a very good study here showing that word association algorithms trained on the internet associate men and women with different careers and whites and blacks with different characteristics. Um, the example they gave is that it turns out in Turkish, um, pronouns don't have a gender. And so, and I'm not gonna be able to pronounce this correctly, so I will not try, but the Turkish sentence is gender neutral, but Google as of 2017, if you put it into Google Translate, you got he is a doctor, he is a nurse. Um, as an example of research um, affecting the world, I put it into Google Translate last night, and that's no longer true, it's she is a doctor, he is a um, but this gives an example that our data sets, you might think up front, like, oh, you know, I'm using the dictionary. What could be more objective than the dictionary? I'm using this corpus of newspaper articles. Um, the data can incorporate bias. Um, another example is photos. So it turns out that facial recognition software performs badly, especially for darker, darker skinned women. Um, this is another great paper I recommend to you where they um, did an experiment saying how many of these photos are you are, are is the algorithm classifying the gender of the faces correctly? Um, answer for men was one percent, and for dark-skinned women, depending on the software, anywhere from twenty to thirty-four percent of the women were classified as the wrong gender. Um, this again is partly a representation problem. So if you look at the photo databases, at least the time of this study, darker-skinned faces were underrepresented. The algorithm just hadn't been trained on enough of them. 
Um, and at least as of 2009, I don't know if it's shifted in the, since then, um, but it's kind of another example of how bias is so deeply permeated into our society. Um, the default camera settings are for lighter skin. So photographs of white people literally are of higher quality. Um, I don't know if that's changed since this article was written. Um, and so because of that, in, that racism embedded into the camera technology, the data set is more representative for white individuals. Um, but the third one, and this is the one that's really tricky, is algorithms. Um, and so here I'm going to switch to more of an explicit focus on consumer finance. That's um, my particular background. Um, and so in lending, housing, and employment, it's illegal under federal law to discriminate on the basis of protected characteristics. Um, and here I'm using the words that are in the statute, race, religion, color, national origin, sex, and there's um, other characteristics as well. Um, so this includes any aspect of a credit transition, excuse me, a credit transaction. So it's pretty sleepy. So it includes advertising, underwriting, pricing. I'm going to go through all three of those. Um, but as I previewed in the introduction, big data sets and sophisticated modeling techniques can introduce proxies for protected characteristics in ways that are opaque and difficult to monitor and that allow firms to tailor offers at the level of the individual. Um, and so advertising is a um, really intriguing example. So targeted advertising is profitable. Well, it's always been profitable. So FinTech hasn't changed that, right? You want to get your message to the audience that's going to be most receptive. Um, you know, and advertising can be beneficial. Um, but unfortunately, even in the pre-internet world, um, you know, some groups got information that was more helpful than others. So there's a pair of studies that show prime mortgage borrowers tend to get helpful information. So if you're a prime borrower, you might get something that says, oh, here's a great financing option you haven't thought of. Hey, I have a competitive rate. Hey, you know, you're going to get something that's more like a nudge that's going to help you take advantage of a good opportunity for you. Um, the advertisements that subprime mortgage borrowers get are very different, actually. So they tend to get advertisements that prey on their fears, that use phrases like, are you drowning in debt? You know, are you scared? Are you afraid? Or they tend to get more kind of misleading advertising. Um, but the studies I'm citing are in the pre-internet age. I'm just trying to establish the point, as I said at the beginning, that there's a sense that there's nothing new in fintech. Um, the dynamics we see in fintech, we've all the consumer finances, um, but manifests a little bit differently. Um, and in particular, Facebook, a lot of the research has been Facebook. And there are two aspects of advertising on Facebook that can lead to discrimination. Um, the first is ad targeting. The advertiser specifies who sees the information. And the second is ad delivery. The algorithm decides who sees the advertisement. Um, and so if any of you have a Facebook account, you may know that when you sign up, you're supposed to give your birth date and your um, gender. And so Facebook allows advertisers to explicitly target on that. They also have um, hundreds, probably this point, thousands of other attributes you can specify on. And you can also specify what's known as a lookalike audience. So you can say to, to Facebook, here's 100 people that are currently my customers. I want you to find 100 more people that look exactly like them. Well, if you think about that, that also replicates discrimination. If your original 100 people are all white or all men or all whatever, you're basically telling Facebook to just go search and find you 100 more of those same people. Um, and so, for example, here is um, an example ad targeting. This is some, from some litigation against Facebook. Um, and you might remember I said in a couple of slides ago, it's actually, you know, there's only a couple areas where discrimination is explicitly forbidden under federal law. That was a bit of a surprise to me. And especially if you think in the world of financial services, um, it's illegal to discriminate in lending, but it's not illegal in federal law to discriminate in checking accounts or investment services or anything like that. So this Facebook ad is completely legal under federal law. If you look at it, it's for one of these, you know, um, discount online trading services. We will don't let trading commissions eat up your profits. Um, and then the right hand side, if any of you have ever gotten curious about Facebook, you can kind of click around. It'll tell you why am I seeing that? And you see in the second paragraph in bold, you know, we will said I only want to reach men ages 20 and older. So women literally didn't see this ad. 
Um, so, you know, you can, I mean, there's some active debate about whether that's discrimination or not. Um, of course, you know, advertisers have always wanted to target to a particular audience, but I think one of the points is that advertisers before probably couldn't do it with quite this precision. You know, even if before you targeted to say a magazine that predominantly had male subscribers, there was nothing to prevent a woman from picking up the magazine and looking at it. Whereas you can't log on to someone else's Facebook account and see the offers they're getting. Um, there's also kind of a really interesting market equilibrium that happens. So the way when you put on Facebook, you know, or any other um, website for that matter, there's an auction that instantaneously runs. And so that auction determines what ads you see. So the ads you see are not the same as what someone else sees. Um, and the winner depends on how much the, the advertiser is willing to pay and also on something called the relevance score um, of the ad, which is kind of Facebook's guess about how quality, high, how high quality an ad it is, how much you're going to like it, how much you're going to click through. Um, the relevant score is determined by an algorithm. So remember that since it's relevant for the next slide. Um, here's another, it's a little bit of a disconcerting expression, but it seems to be true. Um, female eyeballs are more expensive. So women ages 25 to 34 are a desirable demographic for advertisers. And so I even say I'm promoting a mortgage lending site or a job site. Um, my ad may be less likely to be shown to women just because, and I'll just say something stereotypical here, the cosmetics companies are willing to go spend a lot of money because they really want that demographic. And since the price, since those advertisers are willing to be pay so much, sort of by default, they crowd out um, ads for jobs or financial services. So women just mechanically, as a result of this market equilibrium, are less likely to see um, ads in these protected categories where discrimination is allowed, jobs, housing, and lending. Um, but the algorithm itself still can produce disparate outcomes. So Facebook has, this, what I said, this relevance score. It's basically a machine learning algorithm trying to figure out how much you're going to like um, a particular advertisement. And um, a cool series of experiments, the researchers held everything else constant. So, you know, so they didn't say, I only want women to um, see this ad. Um, they bid enough so that this um, kind of market effect I talked about in the last slide is a factor. But even there, Facebook's algorithm still steered on the basis of protected characteristics. So looking at this graph on the right-hand side, the x-axis is fraction of male in the audience. Um, and then there's occupations listed. And so you can see for a variety of occupations, so supermarket clerk, janitor, preschool, secretary, nurse, um, those ads were primarily shown to women, even though the advertiser did their absolute best to make sure it wasn't just shown to women. Whereas things like, um, you know, lumberjack were shown exclusively to men. So there's something baked in the algorithm that can lead to these disproportionate um, outcomes. And as um, I'm quoting someone else, I can't remember, but you know, algorithms are really, really good at finding correlations. And a lot of times those correlations are gonna be connected with a protected class. Um, turning to underwriting models. So underwriting models also, you now have algorithms that are increasingly using hundreds or thousands of variables that only have a loose relationship with credit worthiness. So, you know, what websites you um, go to, what you buy, you purchase on the internet. Um, and especially outside the United States, there's this stuff called digital footprint data. So like, you know, what email you use, what operating system, are you, do you have Android? Are you logging on from a tablet or a laptop? Um, underwriters are extracting that and they're using it to underwrite credit. Um, so one new, if any of you still have an AOL account, you should not use it on the internet because there are people that will charge you more money, for example, based on having an AOL account, or at least there's one study that found that. Um, and this is problematic um, when, when juxtaposed with um, fair lending law in the U.S. because fair lending law in the U.S. says, well, if any of these variables or combination of these variables disproportionately affects people based on a protected basis characteristic, does not meet a legitimate business necessity, and there's less discriminatory alternative exists, it may be disparate impact discrimination and thus illegal. Um, so I'm just foreshadowing what I'm gonna 
mentioned in a couple of slides, which is that if you think about this from an enforcement perspective, you know, obviously it's very easy to look at a model and say, oh, there's a variable in there for race, there's a variable in there for sex, there's a variable in there for religion. That's relatively easy. But when you've got hundreds or thousands of variables, um, you know, it's, it becomes much harder to figure out the correlations and it's much harder to figure out what is too correlated, especially since many of these variables can't be justified as having a relationship with creditworthiness, the way, for example, the cash flow data was in the earlier example. Um, finally, pricing. So consumers are no longer anonymous online. So this is sort of a shift. Um, you know, when the internet first started opening up, one of its great advantages was that you were anonymous. So there was a study on car purchasing from the early 2000s that found that, you know, when blacks purchased cars online, they got prices much more closer to whites. I think there was no price difference relative to going in in person. So initially the internet was like a force for anonymity. Um, now that's no longer true, right? You can be tracked across websites. I mean, your data can be matched with lots of other information. And the result means that firms can present you, like literally, I think we're at this point or close to this point where they can give each person their individual price. So firms can completely take away your consumer surplus for the economists in the audience. Um, and algorithms are increasingly becoming skilled at inferring consumers' willingness to pay. Um, and this is problematic because willingness to pay may be correlated with the protected basis characteristic. Like, Shopping around for credit may just legitimately be more costly for some groups than others, especially if you're seeing different advertisements, right? If you're not, if you're in one of these groups that's not even getting, if you're not getting the handy thing in the mail saying, here's a rock bottom rate um, refinance now, but instead you're getting, you know, some ad that's just designed to make you feel scared and desperate, you've got a higher shopping cost. Um, so this is problematic. It's also problematic from a legal perspective because you can only charge a different price based on a protected class if it's related to credit worthiness in the case of lending. So the courts have said like, well, if characteristic X is related to credit worthiness, you can charge the borrower more. But you're not allowed under US law to say, I'm gonna charge this borrower more because they're desperate and I know I can gouge them. Right. That is not allowed under U.S. law. And some of this, some of the algorithms seem to have the potential to skirt awfully close to that. Um, so challenges, gaps and options. Um, as I just mentioned, so enforcing the existing laws is challenging. So if ads and product offers are targeted to the level of the individual, how do you monitor if discrimination is happening? Um, so I went last night, for example, and looked at the complaint that the Illinois Attorney General filed against Countrywide for um, violating Countrywide, um, Illinois' fair lending laws since we're here at the University of Chicago um, in 2009. And a lot of that was around Countrywide's advertising. It said Countrywide disproportionately advertised in these publications that were targeted towards minority audiences. Well, presumably the... Um, Attorney General of Illinois could figure that out by just looking at that media, right? If, if everything's targeted to the level of the individual and it's such a black box, how do you even monitor if discrimination's happening? Um, second, to go back to the underwriting question, how do you determine whether variables in an advertising, underwriting, or pricing algorithm are correlated enough with a protected characteristic basis to constitute discrimination? So you can imagine this whole cottage industry of, um, you know, clever lawyers um, going out there estimating correlations and saying this is discrimination. And like, where is the line? How do we establish where the line with what, what is correlated enough in this complicated world? Um, because as I discussed at the beginning, you know, a lot of this stuff does have the potential to increase access to credit. Um, but that's not what the law says. The law doesn't say like, does this innovation make some people better off even though some people are worse off? The law is more about is everyone being treated equally? Um, so there's this concept of auditing algorithms and I think there's kind of a general agreement that yes, that would be a good thing, but that's still in its very early stages. So there's no consensus out there on governance or standards. You know, who would conduct the audit? Um, how would you guarantee that it was really independent? You know, you can imagine having the same problems that we've had with the credit rating agencies, for example, in financial crises. What are the standards? So very little of that groundwork has been done 
um, even though there's the general agreement, it would be a good thing to do. Um, also really became clear to me is the researchers that, um, the limits that outside researchers face. So to state something that's kind of obvious once you think about it, algorithms are the intellectual property of corporations. So if you're an outside researcher, how do you test the algorithm? You don't have any right to look at it. Um, it's just clear to me the independent researchers, the ones that don't enter into collaborations are seriously outgunned. So there's like a couple papers where you know, researchers have gotten a budget and they say, well, here, here are my test algorithm, my test ads, and I'm going to submit them into this black box and see what pops out and see what I can infer about the black box from what comes out relative to what I put in. So there's a few studies along those lines. Um, there aren't all that many, and more of what you see is researchers who have entered into collaborations with tech companies to gain access to data and algorithms. Um, those of you who are economists, as you know, Amazon might be the largest employer of economists in the world at this point. I'm not sure, but it's definitely up there. Um, you know, economists have high profile positions at Microsoft and a lot of these tech companies. Um, you know, often these collaborations will say something like, well, you can publish the results um, regardless of what you find. So you, you might say, well, what's the problem? But the problem is that um, this is from... Journal of Economic Perspectives paper that Susan Athey wrote with Michael Luca. Um, you know, firms may not choose to sign agreements about research topics where they don't want to know what the answer is. So the questions that are being asked and funded are questions that the firms want to know the answer to because it increases the firm's profitability, not necessarily the ones society wants to know the answer to. So a lot of these papers, if you read them, they're really kind of about like, well, could the firm have made more money if it didn't describe Discriminate. Well, that's an important question, but the fundamental motive on the, on the part of the firm is to make more money. Um, and there's some big gaps in existing discrimination laws. As I said, federal laws only prohibit discrimination in credit, employment, and housing. So in other areas, bank accounts, investments, retail stores, it's governed by something called state public accommodation laws, which you have um, probably never heard of. So these kind of come from the 1950s. Um, originally, they governed things like interstate travel to make sure that anyone could stay in a hotel, no matter what their um, race or creed was. Um, and they haven't been substantially updated, I would say, to make a broad generalization since the 1950s. Um, six states don't have these laws at all. So if you're in Georgia, for example, there's nothing um, protecting you from discrimination in um, banking because there's no law whatsoever. Um, only five states have explicitly stated that their laws apply to online commerce. I um, mean, you know, luckily a couple of them are states like California, where you would hope would be thinking through the issue. But um, the case law is really new. So if you look at the cases for e-commerce with these laws, it's within the last couple of years. It's still new and it's still evolving. And, you know, the courts haven't really figured out the reach of these laws. Um, and the legal data privacy framework in the U.S. has not evolved with fintech. And so if you think there is a federal framework governing how firms collect, store, and use data, but it didn't envision this explosion of data types, you know, web search data, social media posts, information about your purchases. The framework was not envisioning that kind of data when it was put down. Um, didn't envision the decrease in the financial and computing cost of acquiring processing data or the ability of firms to combine data in ways that were unanticipated by the entities that originally gathered the data. So what data are has changed dramatically since the laws were updated. Um, and these data are crucial. They're the building blocks of the algorithms. Um, a couple states are now enacting laws that are pretty limited, but there's still no like kind of comprehensive federal framework on these issues. Um, you know, Europe has taken a more aggressive approach. And so I'm um, just going to describe it. I'm not necessarily going to recommend going this route because these are complicated issues, but it's interesting to think about how Europe's handled it. So, um, you know, the general data protection regulation, which is a huge complicated regulation, um, but in terms of algorithms, it does place limits on the ability of firms to use only an algorithm. And this is language from the statute to make decisions that affect humans significantly, such as extensions of credit or job searches without explicit consent. Um, firms have to disclose to consumers the types of data and the logic used by the algorithm. And if a consumer is denied, denied credit or a job or something else that's considered to affect them significantly on the basis of an algorithm decision, 
firms have to give consumers the option to appeal to a human decision maker. Um, kind of even more fundamentally, there's um, a Digital Services Act in the European Union, which I um, gather is fairly far along in the legislative process. And that would require annual audits of very large online platforms for any significant systemic risks associated with discrimination. Um, so that's a pretty significant step. And also it would require the very large online platforms to allow access to their data to vetted researchers. So this would actually address this asymmetry um, I talked about a couple of slides ago, where researchers right now um, are primarily restricted to studying the questions that interest companies. This would equal that playing field. Um, so to conclude and summarize what I've said so far, the fact that it can be profitable to exploit vulnerable consumers is not new. Um, I think what is new is that FinTech provides the ability to do so with more scale and sophistication. Um, do we have the governance system in place to keep this in check? Um, as I've mentioned, independent researchers have an incentive to investigate the questions most important to industry. Um, the legal framework has gap has gaps, and um, the government, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't currently have the staff in place to carry out some of the expanded responsibilities that you need if you were going to take auditing algorithms seriously. Um, so there's a Brookings paper that was talking about different options for a federal privacy statute, and it said, you know, just to enforce a federal privacy statute, which is a small part of the problem we're talking about, um, they guess the FTC might need at least 500 more employees. So none of these things, if we were to take them seriously and start building an administrative framework around them, none of them are trivial. So these costs are really clear. Um, the benefits are harder to quantify. You know, you can spin stories of firms that are doing awful targeting and um, preying on consumers with their advertising, their underwriting and their pricing and how this could create a digital divide that's hard to observe. Um, problem is it's hard to observe. So it's hard to make those, um, the costs of inaction, I think, salient to a lot of consumers. Um, thank you. So that is the end of my prepared remarks, but would love to um, talk more with the audience about any questions or issues this raises for you. Thanks, Karen. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'm just gonna open it up to, to the audience for questions. That was really awesome. So th thanks a lot for the for the summary. Uh, a lot a lot of stuff to think about. So um, if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand. I'll, I'll I'll call on you, or you could just speak up as well. Well, the thanks from Steve Gerloff in the chat means a lot to me. He was the chair of the department at Wisconsin when I was a student there. So you never kind of outgrow wanting your department chair to think your work is valuable. So thanks, Steve. Well, on that embarrassing note. <laughs> uh, so Kalinda has a question. Yes, uh, that was uh, really, really interesting. Thank you for presenting that. Um, and uh, my question to you, Karen, is uh, with the current legislation that we have uh, at federal state levels, like I think there was, for example, an Algorithm Accountability Act that was mm -hmm. introduced and seems to have stalled, but maybe there's yeah. now movement again. I mean, from your point of view, are you seeing any movement at the federal or state level that um, looks at regulation around algorithms? And do you think they're promising in terms of being passed? Um, that's a good question that will quickly get me um, ahead of my skis or whatever the um, the expression is. I, 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 I don't know is the honest answer. It does seem like the federal government has an awful lot on its plate at the moment. So I think there's still kind of a lot of, you know, the administration is still not fully staffed. Um, still a lot, I think still pandemic related stuff is taking up a lot of legislative bandwidth. I do know there was legislation introduced into the last Congress that would ban discrimination in um, all areas of financial services. So um, checking accounts and that sort of thing also. I don't know if it's gonna be reintroduced in this um, Congress or not. But I can, I'm happy to send you um, a Brookings paper of consulting, which had a pretty comprehensive review of the different legislative approaches I thought was helpful. That would be great. I'll follow up with you on the okay, so offline. It was, it was a question I'll say on the other side of, the, um, of, uh, of what you've been thinking about, and that is, 
Have you considered how these different types of, the, the, you know, this is new data. In other words, things you can now measure, you know, what the implications are for the identification problems uh, in discrimination models. Mm -hmm. I would put on the table to steal a, a, a term from Andrew Kaplan, is it seems this is an opportunity for so-called data engineering. In other words, ask what data do you need to ask the question, answer the question you want. And I guess it, it's more just a comment that I, I, I would urge you and people who work in this area to think about this as an opportunity to sculpt uh, data sets in ways that address you know, what have often been you know, difficult uh, uh, barriers to credible uh, conclusions. Mm -hmm. I agree. I guess my question to all of you, um, especially who have more of a footprint in the academic world than I do is, you know, do you see any countervailing forces? Because I think it was what kind of like unnerved me the most in doing the literature review was seeing how many, um, you know, foot, how many papers had in their first page, you know, this research was conducted under an agreement with Microsoft, with Zillow, with, you know, Uber, whoever you like. Um, do you see any forces on the horizon that would make a more level playing field for independent research to serve as a safeguard? Um, so uh, that's that's a great question, uh, uh, and um, one of the I, 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 at least I'm seeing some of it. So at, at Booth we have we have Sendel and folks uh, getting together here uh, to study uh, algorithms and uh, machine learning and things like that, how, and particularly focusing on the discrimination and fairness front. Um, and the, these are all independent researchers. Uh, some of the, some of the research might be funded, but the, the idea would be that it's, that it is independent research um, mm -hmm. and how to make algorithms um, basically uh, not be propagation tools of, you know, structural and systemic discrimination. Uh, which is a really hard uh, problem. And at Northwestern, there's, there's a parallel effort uh, with Chris Hammond and, and folks over there. So Chris has been involved in um, uh, these types of things for, for, for a few years, and now he just started a working group literally a month ago uh, mm -hmm. um, and starting a formal center uh, looking at these things. And um, so I think there are efforts. It's just everything's so new and nascent that um, hopefully we'll have papers coming out soon that are that are that are pushing back but i think you know um the book that i i just recently read a book called uh, weapons of math destruction yes that's a great book which i thought was awesome um but again it was you know published pretty recently um yeah so hopefully so i think and also building on what alex said especially for relation to the question for algorithms and um, that's also a really important research agenda in computer science so there's um aaron roth here at penn uh, working on these questions, a lot of other people as well. Uh, I know Chase Lipton at Tepper and several other people both in business schools and computer science departments with a computer science background. And so I think, you know, one of the, that's definitely an area I think where there's a lot of scope for interdisciplinary interaction. Like the computer scientists have more of the tools that they, and they're doing basic research. Like how do you define fairness in an algorithm or like really basic questions that I think will be the, yeah building blocks to take to the more policy questions of what sort of government regulations do we need on algorithms? How can we enforce them? Or how do different algorithms manifest in market outcomes? Questions that economists and policymakers have been more interested in. And so I think this is that at least related to algorithms, that's very much um, an area where academic researchers are interested. They're asking a lot of interesting questions and there's also a lot of scope for interdisciplinary work across these different fields. Yeah, that's reassuring. I mean, I guess, when I give this presentation, there's kind of two questions I struggle with in my head, which is first, am I inflating the dangers? Because, you know, on the other, you know, there are people that are doing these wonderful experiences showing that fintech is allowing, you know, people in the developing world now to get credit on their phones when they couldn't before. Like, you know, this da the data mining is better than nothing if you're in an area where there's no credit scores. Um, so I kind of worry about the, am I overstating the dangers, but then I still just have a sense that we have it as a society kind of mobilize the resources and effort we need to be a, you know, an appropriate counterweight yet. Yeah. And I think that what you just said really hits on the core question. If you're coming into a market where the, if you don't have that much information and the default is to say no, then yeah. you're 
presumably going to improve, at least on some dimensions, you know, you might still, there might be more ways to go with this sort of research. But if you're in a market where the default would be to say yes, and then now essentially you're able to charge higher prices or do things that are exploding people more, then that's going to be a market where it's, you know, potential for more harm. So no answer is harmful or it's not harmful. I think it really is very context dependent on what the default option is for the decision um, in terms of without the information without the additional information. Yeah, right, I agree. To just add uh, to, and to uh, expand on your question, um, the first part, that, can, are you overinflating it? I mean, I, I do research in algorithmic bias and uh, algorithmic fairness, but I look at it from the lens of uh, marketing and business context and more broadly. So what's the impact on consumer, but also what's the impact on firms? And so my research is really about the, the business case for it, for it and against it. And so based on what I've seen so far, no, you're not uh, overinflating the, the dangers about it, but it also has the potential for making uh, fairness and uh, a bias, you know, actually better because but with the algorithms, we have the means to actually examine them, open them up, change them, change the outcome, uh, which is not so easy to do with human beings. But uh, um, mm -hmm. because algorithms are not understood well now, now's the time to really, if, if people want to call it overreact, then let's call it overreact. I don't think it's overreaction, but now's the time to do it so that we can get ahead of it and actually dig into it and understand how the impact is uh, not only in the short term, but in the long term. So that's just a comment. Thank you. We have Andrew uh, with the hand. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. This presentation was was fascinating. Um, I yeah, I learned a ton. I was I was um, I guess in response to sort of the line of questioning that you brought up, it, it strikes me that having that so long as the algorithms themselves are proprietary, they're like there's like independent research can only go so far because it can it can identify patterns and what categories of algorithms will do, but it's never going to be able to speak to you know, what it is that Facebook's algorithms are going to produce because they have so many constraints that they're not sharing, you know, on, on sort of all, so many um, yeah, particular details that they're not sharing. And so, I mean, I think to your point, it seems like, um, like we're, we're setting up a showdown between, uh, into, you know, the privacy of that intellectual property and, and the, the ability to effectively oversee it. Um, in a big way, which will be interesting. Um, but as a as sort of a, s a separate set of questions, I was curious um, when you mentioned that advertisers can sometimes have their ads crowded out by sort of you know others, and so you know they go in without an in intention to discriminate in who's seeing their ads, uh, but that ends up happening because of the way that you know the market demand for particular uh, particular eyeballs. I wonder. Do these companies provide a mechanism for advertisers to say they don't want this to happen? Because um, that strikes me as a, as a, I mean, a fact that if widely publicized, you know, might lead to the kind of change in you know, technology that, that you mentioned with the Google mm -hmm. Translate algorithm. Yeah, and that's where it gets tough. You know, it gets tough in the protected categories. Um, you know, so this Lambrecht and Tucker paper, which I mentioned, which is the one where I got this expression of female eyeballs being more expensive, which is fascinating. I mean, you know, you couldn't, they made the point that under federal discrimination law, you couldn't say I want job ads to be disproportionately shown to women. So it's not clear under the current law that you would have the flexibility to explicitly weigh against what's already they, uh, you, you couldn't go in and there doesn't seem to be the sophistication and nuance in discrimination law right now, as I understand it, to make the argument that says, okay, well, I understand that I'm not allowed to send my ad more to women because that's illegal. But in this case, I have to because otherwise the algorithm is going to misdirect it the other way. I don't think we have that um, way to do it yet. I mean, outside of those categories, you know, you could go in and tell Facebook, I only want to send this to women. You know, you could click that thing or you could say, you know, they don't ask people explicitly about race, but they infer race. 
So they have like these racial affinity groups and say, I infer from, I don't know who your friends are, or what websites you go to, what your race is, that kind of thing. So you can explicitly say to Facebook, yes, just send it to people that clicked this affinity outside of those three protected areas, or just send it to these people that look like my hundred customers who right now all turn out to be women. But I just, I think our discrimination law has not really kind of kept pace with just how complicated some of these questions now are. I guess I was wondering partly even outside of the, the legal context, do the sort of the consumers who are buying these ads know that, you know, other market participants are, are forcing their ads into, you know, a narrower subset of the people, you know, those who aren't clicking these specific um, right. subsets, like, do they have an option to say, you know, I don't want this kind of targeting? It sounds like they don't. Um, I don't think so, because, I mean, I think you get um, diagnostics. So I think Facebook tells you, again, I'm again getting to the edges of my knowledge, but Facebook will tell you, I think, after you, your ad campaign runs, like who saw it and kind of the discussions of who it is. But I think, you know, the algorithm itself is proprietary. And so um, they only describe it in kind of general, you know, the terms. And of course, you can get a you can get a neutral audience if you're willing to pay a lot. So I think they found, you know, a couple of these studies find like, you know, the share of women you get in your audience increases with how much you're willing to pay. So, um, you know, if you're not paying very much at all, you get a more male audience. If you're paying top dollar, you'll get a more even audience. So you can always um, balance it out by paying a lot. So have these um, have these algorithms or the government agencies thought at all about trying to have disclosure laws for algorithms like what you have to you know either having an anonymized data set about how different characteristics map into the decision at hand or whether the algorithm itself needs to at least some parts of it be made public like so something like the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act but for some of these other dimensions. Yeah, well, Europe has gone that way, as I've mentioned. Um, you know, I think in general, disclosure isn't super useful to consumers. Um, you know, it's just kind of too much. I mean, hopefully some of you are more conscientious than I am and don't just automatically click all these boxes that come up because you're in a hurry and you just want to go ahead and buy your new sneakers or whatever. Um, so my sense is that disclosures in Europe are helpful for the press and for researchers. So like, for example, if you go to the digital footprint paper I mentioned, which is based on um, data from Klarna actually, which is I think probably a company none of us used to hear about, but it's one of these ones that, you know, now when you go buy something, it says, you, you don't have to pay it all now, you can do it in four easy payments at no cost to you. Um, it's one of those companies from Sweden. But anyway, they had to disclose in their um, filings that they were using an algorithm and that they were using, um, you know, your email provider and how long you spent on different websites and what time of day, you know, it turns out there's a correlation between credit worthiness and what time of day you log onto your computer, for example. So they had to disclose that in their, and I think that um, there's room for researchers in the press to use those disclosures to really shed a light on what's going on. I kind of see that as the main value more than it um, being useful to an individual consumer. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that could tie into the bullet you have here that um, independent researchers have an incentive to investigate questions more important to industry. And I think that is one of the problems here is if you have to partner with a company in order to get their data, then obviously, as Betsy highlighted a little bit with the difficulty of field work, you're going to have to in some ways um, cater to the company in order to have, but yep. if there was more pub publicly available data, then and that would open up the questions that could be asked without needing to go through these complicated legal agreements or, you know, having a sort of a, an agreement where the company has final say over whether you can publicize your work. Yeah, that's why I find the Europe um, provision intriguing that requires that if the legislation is passed, it's going to require um, very large companies to allow academics access to their algorithms. Um, you know, and there's reasons that's a bad idea if you care about intellectual property and innovation and et cetera, et cetera. But um, it's certainly intriguing from a fairness perspective. Yeah. Uh, and the, I, I just want to add one little thing that I, I have one foot in finance and one world that we don't want to end up in is where this sort of thing uh, becomes like kind of like financial products where 
you know, they become so complex and there's such an arms race in the industry to make them more and more complex, such that so the government has absolutely no ability to, to, to understand what they're doing. You basically need to be these people in order to figure out what these products are doing. Um, you know, and you had the financial crisis and all of these sorts of things being, um, being caused by these like highly leveraged, super yes. complicated products. And that's just, you know, again, Kalinda mentioned this uh, earlier is like, we're at kind of the nascent stage of this. And it's really important for, for re for policymakers and independent researchers to get ahead of it. I think so. This, this was really nice to hear. Thank you. I also had some bad flashbacks to the CDO squared that um various points in putting this together. So I, and I think that analogy actually is perfect, right? Those that were black box, complicated, proprietary algorithms that it turned out no one understood until it was too late. And thank you for um, pairing this. I'm so excited to see the next two papers. I mean, those will really be, a, it's a great fit this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, thank you for coming in the excellent presentation.